The Titanic is remembered in many ways. This mural is in a shopping centre in Hanley, Stoke-on-Trent, the birthplace of Edward John Smith, the captain of the Titanic. There have been many maritime disasters, but somehow there's something special about the Titanic. Its myths, its legends, and a story that seems to grow with every retelling. Of course, the basic facts of the ill-fated maiden voyage are well documented and well known. The White Star Liner Titanic, the largest ship of her day, left Southampton on her maiden voyage on April the 10th, 1912, with 1,308 passengers and 898 crew. She was called a floating palace, the epitome of luxury, and her passenger list boasted every class of person, from millionaires and society's elite down to humble emigrants to the new world. but the hopes and lives of many were cut short when she collided with an iceberg and sank in the early hours of April 15th. The Cunard liner Carpathia was first on the scene by early morning to pick up those people, mainly women and children, still alive in the lifeboats, and to take them on to New York. There were 705 survivors. There were two inquiries into the disaster, the American inquiry put the blame on J. Bruce Ismay, managing director of the White Star Line, the high speed and the lack of enough lifeboats. The British inquiry blamed the speed, lack of lifeboats and Captain Edward John Smith. After the sinking, transatlantic liners travelled further south to avoid the ice, travelled slower and carried lifeboats sufficient for all on board. A recent inquiry blamed the captain of the Californian, only 19 miles from the Titanic, for failing to respond to the Titanic's distress rockets and attempt to rescue, even though it accepted that she couldn't have arrived before the Carpathia because of intervening ice. So, the Titanic is still news, and still controversial. But her story goes beyond the mere facts. It's the myths the legends, the personal memories and associations which are just as much a part of her story. This is the actual dock that the Titanic did sail from. We're just coming into the position where the St. Louis, the Philadelphia and the Majestic were all tied up together because of the coal strike. Coal was taken from all three ships to feed the Titanic so that she could make her maiden voyage. With that red and white box on the key, that's just about where the bow of the Titanic would have been. The bollards that you tied up to are exactly the same ones. They've never been changed since 1912. They've done yeoman service over the years for many, many ships and seen many, many stories. So at 12 o'clock, April the 10th, 1912, this is where the Titanic would have slipped her ropes, tucks would have gathered her up, and taking her straight out to sea. As you know, we know she had a little mess up on the way, which I'll explain when we get nearer. Well, for the first time for probably many years, not only did Sir Hampton Maritime Museum have many of their rare items on view, private collectors came along and included family uh, memorabilia, telegrams of being which we didn't even know existed have now been seen today yesterday we had a, a very very satisfactory and a very large crowd in fact it exceeded our expectations i think there must have been something like two thousand people passed through for those few hours and they were able to see items which they may never ever see so really it's a once in a lifetime experience well 80 years of course is fantastic you know and the weather wise is super so it's been a, a weekend to remember. It's lovely weather down here in Southampton. We've just done a cruise around the original harbour where the Titanic sailed from. Uh, we've been in the Maritime Museum and there's about 150 members here from all over the world. We've really enjoyed this weekend. I'm really glad we came now. And I'm glad we joined this the society too. I don't think ever anybody ever expected the numbers that have come today. I certainly didn't. 
I didn't even realise there was a society. <laughs> so I plan to join now. So. It's incredible that anything is remembered after 80 years. And there is a definite affection, feeling about the Titanic. It's uh, a story that's growing year by year. And you've only got to look at our convention this year to see the uh, popularity of it, the way the fascination with this, with this ship, with the luxury, the period. And after 80 years, it's nice that people can get together and meet as friends and talk about a subject like this. I know my maternal grandfather was actually uh, on the dockside when she left. He was secretary of the Union Castle Line in Southampton. And uh, my dear Aunt Lily, who's age 94, her father was a ship's engineer with the um, uh, America Line on the uh, SS St. Louis. And he got the post of an engineer officer on board Titanic. And he had a premonition of disaster. And uh, he, he decided not to make the trip. And so, of course, uh, he lived to tell the tale. My mother had this dreadful premonition. She'd never had one before, and she never had one after. But she said, no, we, we, we can't do this. It's quite wrong. Something dreadful will happen. And I, I tell you, what the sort of woman she was, she'd got both feet on the ground, and for her to behave like that was absolutely unbelievable to everyone. But she just had that premonition. I went up the gangway on the Titanic, and I looked up at it. I said to my father, what a big ship it is. I said, and as we went up the gangway, my father turned white. My mother asked if he was ill. He said, no, he was all right. Well, we went up to our cabin. Then we took our coats off and stood over the rail, looking at the people below. It was a boat called the New York. She nearly ran into the Titanic, nearly caused the pollution. And my father turned around and said, that's a bad omen. If Captain Gale on one of the tugs hadn't been such a fine seaman and prevented collision, uh, or, or potential collision, when the SS New York double berth for the Oceanic, and the largest ship in the world as she then was, 46,000 tons, as she went by, tremendous undertow, pulled the ship into the park, almost a collision. Captain Gale, with brilliant sails, got his tug in position and saved the collision. And if he hadn't, if it had been me in charge, and if there had been a collision, then the sailing could have been delayed another 12 hours, 24 hours, and she wouldn't have been in that place at that time. Uh, there were all these little factors which together led to this tragedy. Then we had this ridiculous ruling by the Board of Trade at the turn of the century. It said that any ship of 10,000 tons should uh, have 16 lifeboats, totally ignoring the fact that the ship was 46,000 tons, but in law still only needed uh, 16 lifeboats. So you see that from that tragedy we then had um, every ship had sufficient lifeboats for the number of passengers. We had ice patrols, international cooperation. You could say they perhaps didn't die in vain because they made sea travel much safer for future passengers. I saw Captain Smith. I spoke to him. My father spoke to him. He came on deck and he was speaking to my father. I was standing alongside of him and my father was telling him what a beautiful ship it is. And then Captain Smith was telling him about it. He was a dear old man, ever such a nice fellow. I've met him, I should think, perhaps three or four times. I only remember that my father spoke to him several times, and and a couple of times I was with my father. And he took us somewhere. I don't, I'm quite sure it wasn't the bridge, but he took us somewhere which um, was where passengers didn't normally go. I, of course, wasn't a bit interested at seven years of age, but he was very nice, I remember that, and he greatly admired a doll I had. He was very nice to me.